Until now, we've never considered flowing fluids. We're going to consider actual flow today, which is much, much more interesting than static fluids. So I'll start with um, calling to mind the fact that if you're like on a river and you go to the part that's the rapids, that rapids are is a place where the river is moving quickly, right? And that usually happens, let's see if I draw you a river here, can we argue that if the river's like this and then the river gets like this, can you tell me where the rapids would be? Sure, it's going to be rapid right here. And rapid means fast. So that means that if Einstein were floating down this river, he would go doot, 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 doot. And then when he gets here, he's going to And then he's going to slow back down again when he gets to here. Goodbye. And um, <clears throat> that's a general principle of um, fluids that we can show here. I'm going to draw you a tube. It's kind of a funky tube, but the idea is that it starts out with a very large on the left, it starts out with a very large diameter, and then on the right, it shrinks to a smaller diameter. So over here, I've got what I'm going to say is V1. That's the speed of the uh, <clears throat> that's the speed of the fluid over here. And you know that it's it's kind of weird to justify this, but you kind of know that over here, V2 is going to be bigger. V2 is going to be like that, correspondingly much bigger because it has narrowed. So we can specify these as area two and area one. And we see there's some kind of relationship between area two and area one, but before we make that, um, make that concrete, we have to be more careful. So my suggestion is this, that we write a statement for how much volume is going through a certain slice. So if I put a slice right here, if I slice this sucker, I might say how much volume is going through right here. And delta V then would be equal to area one, I'm going to call it delta V one, is area one times the speed that it is in this region times the time, right? Because area times speed, let's see if this is going to be the, uh, the units need to be in volume units. So that could be distance squared times distance divided by time times time. Okay, so we've got uh, the correct units here. And you'll see that this is actually the volume of fluid that's gone through that section right there. And then if I make another note, <laughs> if I make another, I'm a little sick, sorry about that. If I make it, ooh, that's not gonna work at all. I'll just throw that color away, give it to my kids or something. This um, over here, we take another slice of it and consider what's going on here. We could say delta V2 is area two times V2 times delta T. If we look at the same amount of time though, the beautiful statement that we can make is in fact delta V1, delta V1 equals, and these have to be capital V's, delta V1 equals delta V2, which means that the volume of fluid that flows through one section of the tube is equal to the volume of fluid that flows through the next section of the tube. I guess that just means that there's nothing backing up. There's nothing here that's storing some fluid. There aren't any little leaks in it where some of the fluid's getting out over here. No, there's none of that going on. All of the fluid that goes through here has to eventually go through here. And if nothing weird is happening, there are no fluid capacitors or anything, then it's going to just be a steady flow of fluid, and I call this, from the Greek, I call it diarrhea. This is the diarrhea equation. It stands for, uh, let's see, dia means through, and rhea, there are two R's in here, rhea means flow. So this is the equation for flowing through, or the diarrhea equation. Uh-huh. Very good. So by diarrhea, we know that the mass that flows through is a constant number. And we can go on from there and actually state the mass that's going through each of those suckers. <clears throat> well, I guess delta M1, hmm, it'd be nice to have that picture. I can get that picture back. Check this out. Okay, I wanna say that uh, the mass that's going through in area one is the density times delta V1, and the mass that's going through area two during some time is 
the density of the fluid times the volume that goes through over there. And I, in principle, I could even say that the density could change for my fluid. So let's be super general and just say that this could be the case. And then I've got an equation for delta V on the previous page, and so that's just rho one times area one times the speed in section one times delta T. Make sure you note that that's a speed and not a volume. This is rho two times area two times speed two times time. And I'm saying that these must be equal. So um, one cool statement that we have is that uh, delta M1 is delta M2. So we can make this equivalence. Oh, of course, the times will also cancel. And then we can say that uh, density one times area one times speed one is equal to density two times area two times speed two in our fluid. And we're gonna very often consider incompressible fluids. But if incompressible, that means that you can't squish that sucker. I'm not gonna say you can't squeeze it, because you can squeeze it, which will increase the pressure, but you can't squish it, which would cause the density to change. So if it's incompressible, then we can say, well, the, the densities would then cancel. We could say that the area of one times the speed of one is the area of two times the speed of two. And this is the continuity equation for an incompressible fluid. This is the statement of diarrhea if it's an incompressible fluid. <laughs> cool. That means that no fluid is building up. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to be a little bit more careful. Let us consider, let us consider the same tube but sliced exactly edge on so we can see it nice and cleanly. And here it is, and it gets narrower and we're going to put a piston in this tube at two locations. We're gonna consider work done by forces. That'll be awesome. So there's our tube outline, and I'll put a piston in here. And this piston has a certain area. We can label this as area one. And then there's another piston over here. Oh no. Doesn't have to be a piston. It could be just some fluid in here moving that we wanna study. So here's the fluid that's moving during some amount of time. But if I study this, uh, this second area, would you say that during the same amount of time it's moved more or it's moved less? Interesting. Over here, I think it's going to be moving a lot faster. So we might want to consider maybe a similar volume, but that would mean that it's going that distance, which we could call, let's call this sucker, delta x2. This isn't area one, it's area two, stupid. Pay attention. All right, I'm gonna to try to pay attention. This is some volume, delta V. I should label it as such. This is some volume I'm interested in studying, and this is the same volume, delta V. Okay, so this distance is delta X2. That's how much this fluid here moves in some amount of time. It goes like that. And this fluid right here is not moving very much at all. This distance right here, I would call delta X one, because it's slow over here and it's fast over here. Now we've got a different area here and we've got a different distance, but we've got the same volumes and we've got, uh, well, there are some forces, right? Over here there's a pressure. There's a pressure on the left side of this fluid. And that is, it's really a force. That's the force from all the fluid to the left of it. And that's equal to the pressure uh, over here, which all this area is called area one, all this area here is called area two, and this is going to be pressure one times area one. And uh, over here, <clears throat> we've got a force, oh shoot, this force is being acted on, this body of fluid rather, is being acted on to the left by the pressure on this side. So we're ultimately gonna be able to figure out how the pressure changes when a pipe narrows. So there's this force backwards, which we'll call F2, and it's equal to pressure two times area two. That's the reason that this stuff doesn't reach infinite speed, because it's got a force behind it pushing it forward. We wanna know what the force to the left of it is. Really, I'm looking at the limit as these two things get narrower and narrower and closer to the, uh, the interface right here. That's where it's very interesting. So, I want you to think about this force over here. Does F1 do positive work or negative work? And what about F2? 
does this over here, does this pressure, does pressure to, pressure to does, we could actually change this, instead of thinking about the force, we could think about the pressure. The pressure is doing work, we could certainly argue that. This pressure is doing positive work or negative work as the fluid moves this way. And is this pressure doing positive work or negative work as the fluid moves that way? Of course, this guy's doing negative work. <coughs> and this guy is doing positive work. Cool. So I can write down the work that's done by pressure one. Let me uh, let me do that in red. Let's say. Oh gosh, we're getting kind of saturated with red. Let's do a little bit of blue. The work done by one is the force of one times how far one moves the fluid. Right. All right. And that is well, the force of one is just the pressure of one times the area of one times how far the fluid moves in one. And we can make a very similar statement here for work two. Work two is, oh shoot, well work two is gonna be negative. You could talk about the cosine or you could just say that the force is backwards and the thing's moving forwards. But uh, work two is a negative number, so that's gonna be negative pressure two times, uh, oh shoot. Well, we could, we, let's go one step further here before we, before we spell out this one because it's gonna be the same form, of course. What if I noticed that area one times delta x1, area one is the area of this disc, and delta x1 is the height of the cylinder of fluid we're considering, that's just delta v. So this is pressure one times delta v1. And work two is pressure two times delta v2. Two. These are volumes, not speed. Notice how capital they are and how few, how little wing they have. None at all. Uh, but then, uh-oh, uh-oh, we also note delta V1 is delta V2. That's how we set these suckers up, that the volumes are the same. So then we can make a very interesting statement. We can say we can say the total work, work total, is work one plus work two, and that's just the difference in pressures. Check it out, it's gonna be P, let's see, P1 is positive, right? P1's doing positive work, and P2 is doing negative work, and we're gonna multiply that by delta V. Pressure times volume seems to be work. But we know, uh-oh, oh man, we're running out of space a little bit here. We know that the, uh, oh shoot. It seems to me like we know what net work does. Net work changes kinetic energy, doesn't it? Uh-oh, so let's check this out. If we say net work equals delta K, then we could say beyond that, what's our next statement gonna be? I guess next we could say that, um, here's the network, it's P1 minus P2 times delta V. That's equal to the kinetic energy of the second chunk of fluid minus the kinetic energy of the first chunk of fluid because it's supposed to have done work. Interesting, K2 minus Ki. And uh, we wanna consider just a tiny chunk of mass because we're considering the kinetic energy change for stuff. Um, so let's say, consider chunk of mass. Sometimes people call it a differential mass element. Uh, we're gonna say delta M is the density times this little chunk of volume. Remember this limit is as the chunk of volume goes to zero. There's some calculus behind here, but we're not touching on that exactly. Then I can say that the kinetic energy of some chunk of fluid is one half that differential mass chunk times the speed of the chunk square. And that, well, that differential mass chunk is rho times delta V. So let's write one half rho times delta V, here we go, two V's in one equation, times V squared. See, we've got volume here and we've got speed right here. And I don't want you to get stressed out because stuff's about to get really interesting. Our next statement is this. Now we can say that net work 
network is P1 minus P2 times delta V, volume, right? That differential volume element. But that, oh man, that's just going to be the change in kinetic energy of our chunk of stuff. So that's one half the density times the speed at two square minus one half the density times the speed at one square times V. You see how I've factored out that differential volume? I factored this sucker out because I know that this is change of kinetic energy. So I'm just plugging in this kinetic energy thing. I'm plugging in this right here and right there and putting in little ones. Everybody okay so far? So then I get to make a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful cancellation and that is those Vs. Volume is no longer important here. We've got speed here and speed here. So I can say that, well, I'm gonna multiply, uh, no, sorry, I'm not doing any multiplication. I'm just gonna get all the ones on one side. So that says P1 plus one half density times speed one square equals P2. Now I've moved this guy to that side, so it's positive. P2 plus one half density times V2 square. And I'm gonna put that equation in a box. I'm gonna ask you to think about it a little bit in just a moment.